So I'm looking at uh, quite a specific, I'm just going to look at the whole global analysis. I'm looking at the global analysis for healthcare work, healthcare waste, in the context of um, COVID-19. And this was a piece of work that we did, a collection of people, and I'll tell you how it came together, with the World Health Organization. We started trying to pull guidance together in March 2020. And everything we were doing was based on the previous influenza pandemic, and we knew that wasn't right. So when we started to look at waste management again, it was quite a big picture because we just didn't know the modes of transmission. So I'll do a little bit about ISWA. So ISWA is a, an organization, it's an NGO. It was based in Geneva for quite some time, and it's now currently based out of Rotterdam. It represents all stakeholders in waste, and it does across sectors. It, um, we, I'll tell you a little bit about the working groups as well because we cover all aspects of waste and we prefer really not to call it waste anymore because we're very much looking at embedded resources in things. So we are looking at promoting professional waste management. For anybody that's been in the waste sector for a very long time, it's not necessarily always been as professional as it perhaps could have been. And we're pretty good here. When you take that at a global level, Think Italy, think some of the um, African nations, think India, think places where everything has a value. Maybe it's not being as well managed as it should be. So what ISRA is doing is trying to it's trying to promote the good management of healthcare waste. Well, all waste, but particularly healthcare. 109 countries are represented, and 44 of those have a national member, including the UK. So the UK is a national member of the Charles Institute of Waste Manager. We cover pretty much every continent. So you can see where the, where the colours are on here. We have representatives from those countries, and we're branching out even further. Interestingly, of one of our biggest new members is China, because they've suddenly realised that they have quite a lot to bring. They have also quite a lot to learn, because you cannot, and they cannot continue to just do things the way they have been if they want global acceptance. So coming back to this report, how did it come... I'm going to put that down. How did it come about? I'm going to look at who contributed to it. And when that's not me, I'm not even touching it. <laughs> I'm going to look at the headline findings of the report. How much media interest this garnered? Because that was incredible. And then the recommendations that are contained within the report. It's about 40 something pages. Um, it's not that heavy reading, but when you start to drill into some of the numbers, it's really quite scary. I'm going to, right. So looking at the people that have been involved in this, we started off broadly with the United Nations Development um, Program, with UNDP. They've always had a really good interest in healthcare waste, and they've got some real good expertise out there. Um, people like Jorge Emanuel, who was involved in the Ebola crisis and managing waste from that, he, he suddenly is like, I've retired, but actually this is a little bit interesting, so I'm coming back. So we've got Jorge's come back. We've got the GEF, the Global Environmental Fund, we have Secretariat of the Basel Rotterdam Stockholm Convention. So one of the things that healthcare waste and all waste really is covered by is conventions and regulations and protocols. You can't just like move it around. You've got to do it properly. Uh, UNICEF became very, very interested in what we were doing because of the um, number of children that were involved. Healthcare without harm do cause me challenges because they don't want anything burnt. Understandably so. They want all plastics removed from healthcare. They want all single use removed from healthcare, and they don't want it burned when we've got it at the end. So healthcare without harm for me is really quite a challenge. But we work really closely with them, because with that scale of people going, you can't do this, and us going, particularly with IPC going, but everything's going to have to be disposed of, it's all going to be single use. Somewhere in the middle of that, we meet a compromise. Stop TB, because it's a respiratory pathogen, and Stop TB were like, look at all the expertise we've got. They were a brilliant partner in this. The Global Fund. We just come off, or I just come off the back of a project with the Global Fund, like literally the 26th of February 2020. I was still working on stuff with them. Looking at what? Rapid diagnostic testing. Oh, what do we call it? Lenathy. Oh, well, let's look at small PCR testing out in, you know, in healthcare centres. So we'd come in with all that knowledge, fortunately, on how to get rid of all the nasty chemicals from PCR and how to get rid of LFDs. Handy. ISWA, the organisation I'm representing today. Medicines Sans Frontier, the doctors on the ground, they were brilliant. 
Riders for Health. They've nearly not really had anything to do with healthcare waste in the past. But what they were doing, they were taking supplies out. And they then realised if we were taking supplies out, they could bring waste back. So we started to get some more centralised functions. Unido, and obviously, and finally, the CDC. We also had, at local and national level, various ministries of health and um, global agencies that were trying to be involved. So it was a real collective thing. This report is like the final stages, because all the way through we were writing guidance, and we were supporting Dr. Mike Ryan and Ted Ross and everybody in the WHO to get the waste message out, because we were having so much waste and nowhere to send it to. So what were the immediate needs? PPE. The immediate needs were to have PPE as the primary goal, getting PPE out there. So we had a global portal set up, seven UN partners for that, and they supplied 87,000 tonnes of PPE between March 2020 and November 2021. 87,000 tonnes is quite a key figure here, because this is to healthcare. This isn't just to people working in shops or factories or food production. This was for healthcare. Um, many of the systems were under massive stress before we even started. We have you know, countries where I had no infrastructure, and then suddenly we've got a pandemic and we've got loads of healthcare waste. And the other thing that I am passionate about is the environment and crisis, uh, climate crisis didn't stop because we're having a pandemic. It didn't go, we'll just have a break on global warming because we're, you know, a bit of break on climate change because we're a bit busy doing something else. No, that's continued to go apace. So we've had to try to manage the waste in the context of a global climate emergency. Healthcare waste has been problematic, partly because before we even started, not in the UK and particularly in North America, but across the world, three out of ten healthcare facilities don't have infrastructure to manage healthcare waste to start with. Like they have nothing. It just goes out either with the general waste or it gets left out at the back and the cows come and have a bit of a chomp on it or whatever. But it doesn't go to any managed facilities. We obviously had a state in the obvious here. The generation of healthcare waste increased substantially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And some of the Asian cities experienced a 10% increase in volume. But that was a reported 10% because they weren't recording it before that. And then suddenly they go, oh, we've got healthcare waste, so we've got 10 times more than we had before, but we don't know what we had before. So it's quite complicated when you start to unpick it. I have a feeling in some cases it was probably even more because they weren't using any PPE, they weren't using any of the medical facilities that, we're now, that, we, that were pushed in to manage COVID. This is a bit of a shocking statistic. Four to five percent of global greenhouse gases emissions globally come from the delivery of healthcare. Not healthcare waste, but healthcare as a whole. So particularly pharmaceuticals, the manufacture of equipment, the manufacture of pharmaceuticals, the manufacture of PPE, the movement of PPE. So good healthcare waste management is what we're all aspiring to. Unfortunately, through the pandemic, a lot of people aspire to just get it to the nearest fire. That is a sad reality that a lot of PPE at a global level has been incinerated, but not in an incinerator, just in a little brazier outside the back of the healthcare facility. And a lot of those are plastics. So when we start to look at the long-term health effects of people inhaling some of those plastics, we also don't necessarily know the provenance of some of those plastics. So we don't know that there aren't persistent organic pollutants and all the other nasties that sit within that. So was all this PPE really necessary? With hindsight, I suspect the answer would have been no. But at the time, the answer was, just keep pushing it, just keep pushing it, push the PPE out. Then, probably about the end of 2020, they started to go, okay, is this essential PPE? Or is this PPE that we think is nice to have because it makes us feel safe and secure? A lot of single use, a lot of masks, a lot of gloves. One of the things that other countries have done that we haven't particularly is they have put much more investment and time into decontaminating multiple use or reusable PPE. We have gone down the risk-based approach and said we'll have single-use PPE because it's, you know, we, we all consider that risk, we can afford to do it. And we have, a lot of countries don't have that luxury and they've been decontaminating gloves, they've been decontaminating what we would call class a single use because they've had no other option. 
But just a shocking statistic, and I did pull this presentation together at the end of March, beginning of April, while we were still wearing more masks, but about 3.4 billion single-use masks are thrown away daily at the moment. That's a lot of masks. This is a slide that's in here. It is, it is available in the report as well, but it just shows how many gloves have been supplied, how many gloves and masks have been supplied by the United Nations. Another challenge that they had to get the PPE out there was commercial airlines stopped. Nobody went on holiday. We weren't taking bits and bobs from here to there just on a little charter plane. No, nothing was moving. Airlines were shut down. Airports were shut down. So the way to deliver this PPE and crucial medication was actually to piggyback onto the United Nations food programme. So we were having to share plane, I say we collectively, to get the PPE out there, to get waste management equipment out there, et cetera, we piggybacking onto the food programme. So it was a pretty comprehensive, collective response. Classification of wastes. Most countries classified everything as healthcare waste, when in reality it should have been our original 10 to 15% of that that did have a risk. So yes, your result generating processes, totally. But your, you know, all the um, people that were just walking around wearing PPE in hospitals, so people in offices, people in the um, food production, were wearing the same medical PPE as you were wearing in hospital settings. One of the problems we had in the UK was that our waste contractors came along and said, that's healthcare, that is. We'll collect it for you, we'll give you the bags, we'll call it infectious clinical waste. We've even had people writing in journals saying every single street corner should have an orange bin on it to collect PPE from the general public. What? First of all, it's not a route of transmission, and secondly, in that environment, that's a complete misclassification. But we have had that, so we need to be really careful. WHO indicated that procedures should carry on as normal. So we did supply 5 million biohazard bags to pick up the 87,000 tonnes of PPE that were supplied. Hmm. That's only enough for 61,000 tonnes. Not really bothered to the 26? So there was still a disconnect in between the people that thought they were doing the right thing. It's been a bit of a a roller coaster to say the least. Six billion tests have been carried out globally. We've only shipped 140 million by the United Nations. We've done nearly two billion in the UK. That does include the devolved administrations. I know I'm in Scotland. Um, 20, so even the 140 million that was supplied by the UN, 206, sorry, 2,600 tonnes of um, plastic wastes, and 731,000 litres of potentially chemically contaminated wastes. Mostly with no home to go to. So we've had massive challenges trying to capture that. And 97% of the plastic from these kits is incinerated. I have said that generously, because actually it's just been open burned or dumped. Vaccination waste, we've given 11, point, uh, 11 billion doses of vaccination waste, or oh, sorry, 11 billion doses of vaccination that's created uh, 150,000 tonnes of additional waste globally, um, 90,000 tonnes of glass vials that has probably been just dumped. And when we think of the value and the value of glass vials and we look at what the actual components of the vaccination are, a lot of those could have been recovered, particularly in countries where glass is an absolute premium. Uh, and they'll never be supplied in plastic for whole pharmacological reasons. 50,000 tonnes of syringes and needles. I am really glad about that. Really glad about that because of the way it was supplied. Because on here we've got 11 billion doses. Normally the WHO, UN, USAID, Gavi, the Global Alliance, Vaccine Alliance and the Global Fund together fund 16.2 billion injections a year. 40% of which are given with reused equipment. So the fact that we did get single-use equipment for the vaccination programme for me was a major win because it meant we were doing it safely. No requirement to wear gloves when vaccinating. WHO guidance, PHE slash UKHSA, PH, PH Scotland, Public Health Scotland, Public Health Wales, you don't need to wear glass gloves when you're vaccinating. But people did. 
and they did because the media called them out. So the first vaccination, you saw a photograph, a lady wasn't, it was a lady giving the lady an injection, she hadn't got gloves on, and they went, oh, dirty, she'd be wearing gloves. Called you out, Daily Mail, and it was really about the, the way that the media said, but well, I think you should be wearing gloves. Nothing to do with your professional judgment that says I don't need to wear gloves. So the next thing we've got to do is start educating the media. Because from the media, we can then say, they can go back to the public and say, no, they, they are right. Because at the moment, I don't really have the support of the media, the general papers. What we have to do is say, yeah, we don't need to wear gloves for this. We do need to hand wash. We do need to use alcohol gel in certain situations. But we've got to keep that in balance. We need to look at innovative solutions for not wearing PPE, reusing PPE, and disposing of the vast amounts of PPE that there are. So I'm just checking the time. We need to look at polymers. What are PPE, what's PPE made of? Can we depolymerize? Can we do something creative with it? Because we can't just continue the way we are. And if we are going to continue to wear PPE in the way we are, and at the levels we are, we have to be innovative with how we dispose of it. So we have to design for end of life. I'm implementing reverse logistics which is what Glo Riders for Health did. We need to strengthen coordination between global health donors, logistics, IPC, and, and you know, the whole infection prevention and control. I think we have massively done a lot where it's come to waste and IPC through this. We've worked with the national IPC, so, so from a waste perspective, globally, IPC has come to the table on everything that we've done and been realistic about expectations. We need to support behaviour change away from single use and overuse of PPE. And we need to prioritise regional and national PPE cells. We cannot just expect for it to continue to all be supplied from certain hubs in the country, in the, in the world, particularly where those hubs get shut down because their airports shut. Nationally, I think for me it comes about national regulation and also the implementation and oversight of that regulation. It's all very well putting good regulation there, but if nobody's checking it, if nobody's managing it, nobody's monitoring it, then it's no use. So we need to look at putting waste management in health budgets. And it's something that the Global Fund has recently done. You can bid for funding for your country to have healthcare waste treatment facilities in place. But you have to look at your national infrastructure to say what you need. So it's no good me supplying some really superb autoclaves with a hint of microwave and everything else, and I've actually got no water or electricity. But what I have got is solar. What I can do is compost. So I have to look at what I can do. So at that point, I have to look at what I'm buying as to how to get rid of it to see whether it fits with national infrastructure. And as I say, we need to continue to strengthen collaboration. So here we're not at an international level, a national, but we need, also need our health, um, our ministries to work together. Training. At local level, we need to improve training, not only for what people are generating, not only for what people are using, but how to dispose of it, an appropriate disposal, because we do have a lot of over-disposal. We do have some partners from this report. So we had Ruth String from Healthcare Without Harm. Mike Ryan was a massive supporter of it. The other thing I was going to say is media interest. Oh my goodness me. We were meant to release this report on the 1st of December. And there's always a press release put out. WHO put press releases out for any big report. They got swamped for television adverts and, every, and media, and even a lot of the UK papers, and Al Jazeera Rare, and all these news. And they just went, um, I think we'll just run it by legal once more. So we took the whole report back, ran it by legal teams, multiple legal teams, and then it finally got released on the 1st of February, which had a, a webinar launch, which I, I was privileged enough to chair the webinar launch. It is a big report. There is a lot in it. But hopefully you'll find it interesting if you do get to read it because it really focuses on PPE and what's needed and what's not. And I've pretty much stuck to time, I think. About a minute over. Thank you very much.